we can start now. Thank you very much, Brother Pia, for explaining the sutta and finishing this uh, sutta. Uh, we will take questions from the floor now. Uh, Sister Isim, over to you. Thank you, Sister Wendy. Oh, by the way, uh, if any of you are typing those questions, uh, don't address to me because I don't normally look at the chat. I'm focused on the text. So direct it to the people in charge, okay? Okay, yeah. We, we will check also. Thank you, Barbia. Okay, uh, good evening, brothers, sisters in the Dharma. Uh, let me read out the questions now. Mm. This is from HK Go. May I know how does one understand this sutta in terms of practice? Is it right to say that the practice of each of the four divine abodes on a silo basis will lead to non-returning or it must be done in a combo basis only then it will lead to non-returning? Okay, very interesting question. Alright, now non-returning it means we have overcome the body, the senses. We are no more attracted to the body and sensuality. We are we no more enjoy sensual pleasures, especially sexual pleasures. So it, it is quite a high level of practice, right? Uh, in fact, uh, on a layman's level, normally we would direct ourselves to. Uh, stream winning and one's returning right so that was easier uh, in the sense of uh, we just reflect on impermanence and then uh, we overcome a bit of great hatred illusion all right but laymen also can become non-returners they can attain non-returning by practicing deep meditation so whether we practice the four brahma viharas that is loving kindness uh, compassion, joy, and equanimity, or other kinds of meditation. The idea is to reach jhana. Now, why jhana is so important? Because jhana means you have gone into this deep meditation, you are able to free yourself from the body. You are normal, controlled by uh, what you see, nice or not nice, what you hear, nice or not nice, smell, taste, touch, and thoughts. You are free from all that. So jhana is like that. You're, you're free from your body and uh, you have this profound joy beyond the body. Now once you can attain that, that level of uh, pleasure and joy, you are no more interested in the physical pleasure of the body anymore. And that's non-returning. So yes, if you practice loving kindness, you to attain jhana. Uh, and then from jhana you cultivate further inside you can attain non-returning yes or you can go into even breath meditation it's possible too and laymen can also do that there are stories about laymen who are non-returners the most famous one of course uh, is the story of the potter Katikara, okay, who, who, who was a layman his whole life taking care of his two blind parents and he made pots uh, it doesn't sell the pots, you exchange the pots for uh, support from from the public and, and then he's able to even support the, the, the Buddha of his time. Okay? So, but it's difficult for a layman to attain non-returning because he must be very good in his meditation, he must be able to attain jhanas. So attaining jhana uh, leads to non-returning as well as possible to lead to arahathood. So these are the two goals for monkhood, for, for nunhood, for, for those who are ordained, because their life is meant for, to, for meditation. Renunciation is to create the ideal conditions for meditation so that they can attain jhana and attain arahathood in this life itself. So I, I hope that you find something there to answer your question. If not, please ask again. Thank you, Brother Pia. Another <coughs> question from HK Go. Um, may I know from the practice perspective, what can we draw out from this sutta as the metaphors are so wide 
covering from mm. cosmology down to yes. morality. Yes, it depends on your interest, you see, because this sutta is very broad, so it's, it's more speaking to the public uh, to catch their interest, some, something that someone is interested in, they say, oh, I want to know more about Buddhism, and then from there they go on to other things, because there are many other suttas. So, and I'm take it as that the Buddha is aware of how human society evolve and what is Im really important in society what is it that really makes our society worthwhile make it human even make it divine if you like right so uh, the Buddha talks about some kind of universal value God Dharma all right so that's one way we, we can uh, interpret this sutta uh, another one is uh, about karma. Okay? No matter what class you belong to, uh, as long as you uh, make sure you, you, you create good karma, then you are a good person, You're, you are living a worthwhile life, and you, are, you contribute to a society that is healthy, wholesome, and productive. So in a sense, it is quite worldly because the Buddha is addressing the world. Okay, so Buddhism, in other words, the Buddha, in other words, gives a very open teaching, so anyone can join through different what interests them at first, and then from there they go further to you know look for what is really Dharma based that the Buddha teaches about mental cultivation and about awakening. So th these are Dhamma doors, if you like. Okay? Okay, thank you, Brother Pia. The next question <coughs> from Sister Grace Lim. I don't understand how this sutta takes a tone of humor. Oh, yes. As I said, the, the, the humor is very subtle. Uh, it's only when you understand the Vinaya, the monk's rules, when you read some of those uh, remarks the Buddha made that what the devas did, uh, then you, you say, okay, you know what the Buddha is talking about is indirectly referring to the wrong things that the monks were doing. Because monks not supposed to eat with their uh, fingers, not supposed to put their finger in their mouth and so on. But the devas did that. See? So uh, you, that is that is humorous in that sense. Uh, humor is one of those things which can be quite tricky for, for some people. So that is why some people, uh, when they, they first studied the uh, Aganya Sutta, they thought, oh wow, the Buddha is very scientific, he's talking about uh, the, the, the universe, you know. But there, there are many aspects we can look at it depending on, on your interests, okay. So, what you can do is that there's a section on humor in the introduction to the Sutta, you can, you know, in your own free time, read up that section on humor in the notes that you have with you for today's study. Okay, thank you, Brother Dia. And the next question from Brother Danny Dio. Although Buddhist rejects caste system, but we always wish for our good merits would lead to good rebirth, like upper caste families. Any contradiction to this? Mm. Oh yes, <laughs> the way you put it, yeah, I would say there is a contradiction. Uh, th this is a big problem, you know, because uh, in India you find the caste system still a big problem. Although it is illegal, uh, this caste system is officially illegal in India, it's still very strong, so all ways, uh, you know, don't die so easily. And uh, the Brahmins still, you know, have the upper hand and uh, there are lots of uh, uh, Dalits or outcasts in, in Maharashtra especially who are Buddhists, you know, and uh, they, they, they face a lot of social difficulties and discrimination and so on. So we, we do have this social reality. Of course, one way is they can use Buddhism to strengthen themselves into a, a social force. So that's why social teachings are also very important. Uh, Buddhists learn to work together, learn to be unified, uh, learn to work together and, and not become supporters of foreign missions, end up uh, becoming like tributaries to foreign foreign countries, you know. So then you have a big problem. 
the, you find the Buddhists become disunited by the foreign foreign missions or foreign Buddhists and like Buddhists in, in Malaysia but they're very disunited because of the foreign missions so in Sri Lanka you, you still have problems of, of caste although officially they're trying to you know cosmeticize and say oh no no we, we, are, we are over this we, there's no more caste uh, but once it comes to marriage and it comes to temple land starting a foreign mission you find wow there will be a lot of uh, underhand work and, and caste going on so it, it's quite real so in other words uh, the, the, the influential monks, the famous monks got to talk about these things they got to speak out, they got to say yeah we don't want cars in any way even in a, in a disguised form you know so it's good you ask this because we need to be aware what is really going on you see the problem with Buddhists is we don't, we don't like to talk about certain things and because we don't like to talk about it, it happens it is allowed to happen so we, we are very nice people so under the niceness all these bad things happen and, and we and that's not good so it's very important to learn to speak out then we can change then we can you know do something really significant for society so maybe one day you can have a special forum or not to deal with these issues and, and really hold catch the snake by the neck and, and sort things out then Buddhism will become a really considerable social force in Malaysia and in Singapore. So right now, uh, the, the Buddhists are their own hindrance. We, we don't face problems from outside. Like the Buddha says, any whatever will destroy Buddhism comes from within. You know, a, sh a boat or a ship that sails will never sink as long as water from outside doesn't go in. When water goes into the ship, into the boat, it will sink. Right. So we must keep our boat dry in that sense. Okay, we must bail out this water. This water is the disunity, wrong views, foreign uh, allegiance, you know, uh, looking outside our country, looking outside our community instead of working together and competing with each other. Not just caste. Caste is not really an issue in Malaysia Singapore. Uh, you can Yes, you can say, okay, I, I want married, I want my children to be successful and happy. That, that is different, that's not really caste. Uh, when you think in that way, you also tell yourself, okay, I'm, I'm doing this, I want to be successful so that I can be effective in social work, so that I can be effective in changing society. So you become a very good scholar, a good thinker, then you learn to speak out what's wrong so you build up your strength first and then you know your direction you know where you're going and uh, you know what to do then you, people will respect you you're not just famous but you can change society you can change the world much of the freedom we enjoy today is because someone long ago dared to speak out dared to stand up they, they made changes and then we have free edu we have education we have freedom of information we have uh, we can learn science we have a lot of freedom in in our country today and because certain people made those sacrifices so when we look up to merits and and success we must also see it as a kind of sacrifice as a dedication okay so my approach is i w i want to use the suttas what the buddha himself taught to tell you all, to tell the world that this is what the Buddha taught. Not all those later things, the second turning of the wheel, the third turning of the wheel. That's all someone else's turning of the wheel. I mean, you don't need to reinvent the wheels. We want to go back to the Buddha. We want to know the Buddha. We want to practice Buddha Dharma, not someone else's teaching, or someone who's unawakened. Right? So it's, it's a very big issue. Okay. All right, let's uh, go to the next question. Thank you, Brother Pia. Our next question from Sister Yvonne Wong. Can laymen attain a rahanship? The simple answer is yes, but very rare. Because to attain a rahanship, you have to be able to meditate very well, attain jhana, overcome bodily attachment. Uh, so if your family is very difficult, you know, so the simple answer is yes, there are 
very rare mention of arahats. Uh, if you look carefully, you find it is possible to like guess that this uh, great saints are arahats, lay people, you know. But uh, they are rarely mentioned, as I said. So short answer, yes, possible, but very rare. And uh, I've written about this why it's not why they are not mentioned, and then there are some interesting points about layman arahats. So if you want to get more notes on that, please uh, message me. I will look up those notes and and mail them, email them to you. Yes. Thank you, Brother Pia. Um, the next question from Mon Rivera. Which would be more helpful as a perspective to study the Sutta? As a parody, as Combridge points out, or as getting deep? Some others take it a bit literally. Explaining the Sutta is scientifically based. The sutta should be taken as suttas, neither scientifically nor traditionally. Okay, uh, we we have ethnic Buddhism. Ethnic Buddhism put race first, right? So you have Sinhalese Buddhism, you have Burmese Buddhism, Thai Buddhism, Chinese Buddhism, especially Chinese Buddhism. Chinese Buddhism is basically Confucianism in morality, Taoism, in beliefs and superstition and uh, the words, only the words are Buddhist, lots of words, big words but there's very little Buddhism there, the, the Buddhism of the historical Buddha so when, when you put race first then Buddhism is just a handmaid, Buddhism is a servant, a slave, that's all Okay, and, and that'd be very sad Okay. So we must put the Buddha first. So when I talk about uh, local Buddhism, like Singapore Buddhism or Malaysian Buddhism, uh, I'm not talking about, you know, you use Buddhism to promote a race. I'm talking about as local people, we work together to study the suttas as it is, what the Buddha taught. What we're doing now is we are promoting Sinhalese culture. And, and in Sri Lanka, they, they're changing your slippers now. They, they are upgrading their syllabus to promote more Sinhalese culture. So you, you're beginning to see that going coming into our countries, and we don't want that. And, and the Thais are bringing in all this uh, fortune-telling and amulets and magical things, you know. So we, we don't want that. We want to know the, the Buddha Dharma, simple as that. So if they come with that kind of teaching, there are individuals who are very good in suttas from different countries, we treasure them. So take the suttas for what it is. When you approach the sutta, ask yourself, what is this sutta teaching us? So it doesn't matter what Gombrich or Gatin, both are really great scholars, they have a lot of things to teach us. Use those teachings, use their wisdom, use their diligence. The, the great thing about the Western scholars is they are very diligent they never say, wow, chim, very deep, and, and then they just, you know, go away. And, and they, they never really become free. They're always serving foreign missions, for missionaries, and they're not building up a local culture. And we are disunited because of that. This is the main problem in Malaysia right now. We are disunited by Buddhism itself. So we, we've got to get united. Otherwise, Another generation, you will just see more foreign temples, but no Malaysian temple, okay, so to speak. So the, the Philippines, I think the, the uh, Mon is from the Philippines, so you, you you'll notice this problem is very difficult to teach Buddhism there, but it's possible. So go on teaching, go on teaching. You you want Buddhism to grow in the Philippines, you need the suttas. Otherwise, you end up bring, just bringing in Sinhalese Buddhism, Thai Buddhism some other kind of Buddhism. There's already Japanese Buddhism. Then you'll be reborn as a Japanese, you'll be reborn as Sinhalese. <laughs> so if that's what you want, go ahead. <laughs> but I want to, uh, you know, be a stream winner at Nirvana. See? So it depends what you want. Right, next question. Thank you, Brother Bia. Next question from Hishke Go. Sorry, sorry. Uh, Brother S.T. Lee. This sutta discusses the evolution of society in an orderly fashion. 
During the time of the Buddha, all these classes of society were already in existence. Did this evolution occur before the time of Buddha? Of course, you know, all this evolution started. Uh, uh, one theory is that you know these uh, very powerful invaders, they, they were fair-skinned Aryans from Central Asia, they came down and then they uh, took over the lands of the dark-skinned local people who were pushed down, down south. And then uh, they introduced a caste system so that you know they don't mingle with these uh, locals who, who are different from them in many ways. So it, it started long before the Buddha, but it, it became quite bad just before the Buddha's time. But what is interesting during the Buddha's time, the central Gangetic plain, where the, the Buddha land, you know, the central Gangetic plain, the, the plain around the river Ganges, northern central India, they are mostly under the influence of the Kshatriya, the, the Buddha's clan. Okay? Not, not the Buddha's own clan, but Kshatriyas in general. The Brahmins were losing their influence. They, they were being pushed to the far west. Uh, one reason uh, for this is because uh, the country was becoming very rich. This, it was the Iron Age. They discovered iron. The kings were using iron to make better weapons and, and, and vehicles. They got stronger armies, so they, they built bigger kingdoms, empires, and uh, people have more peace and business grew, m money, economy grew and so on. So, and there's a lot of freedom of thinking and speech. So the Brahmins were losing their age because of this, right? But then uh, the Brahmins were very clever and cunning. They, they also learned all these things. They used these very same tools to hit back on, on Buddhism. For example, they, they wrote uh, the, the Bhagavad Gita specifically to attack the Buddha's teachings. To show what's what's uh, wrong in, in Buddha's teaching, killing, for example, is right. And in, in, in the, the the highlight of that Bhagavad Gita, where Arjuna, you know, says, "Oh, it's okay to kill." Uh, this someone tells Arjuna, "It's okay to kill. That's your duty as a kshatriya is to kill." You know, so you you have this amazing development. How religions try to neutralize each other, right? So if you don't know Buddhism. You say, wow, you know, this Bhagavad Gita is a very interesting uh, sutra. The Lotus Sutra is a very interesting sutra. That's because you don't know what the Buddha taught. And then you allow uh, other sutras written by non-Buddhists or written to sabotage Buddhism. You think, wow, they're great. And then you're going to have lots of problems that way. You will lose Buddhism. In fact, you don't have Buddhism in the first place. That's very sad, isn't it? Okay, that's next question. Okay, thank you, Brother Pia. Next question from HK Go. In practice, how do we differentiate Nibida, bracket revulsion, mm -hmm. against the conventional burnout feeling mm. towards the worldly pursuit? Oh, yes. This burnout feeling, you just feel tired with the world. You are tired of you know saying why am I doing all this rat race right, and you have no way out. <laughs> that is, burn out. You you just uh, don't know what to do. See, in a sense, the nibida or revulsion starts with burnout. That also happened when the young Siddhartha saw an old man, sick man, dead man. He suddenly burn out. He said, "Wow, is that this is what life is?" You know, so he doesn't know what to do. So. He had to get out of that situation. He, he couldn't do anything in the palace. He realized all those pleasures that cheated him. They were, they were not real. I mean, they are nice, yes, but in the end, it's the same thing. So you keep getting the same thing, and he was really tired of it. So he had to go away. He had to renounce. That's why people travel. You know, people who have get burned out, they, they travel. They want to see new perspective, new way of life, discover new, th new things. Uh, for me, every time I, you know, af after this class, I will go back to the sutta. I discover new things. When I read something, I say, "Wow, the Buddha is talking something new here," and to me, that is new. So you never get burned out with sutta study that way because you keep discovering something new in what the Buddha has taught, building up on what you understood before, right? You you listen and then you allow it to sink in. You reflect on it. You see how it connects with the world outside. 
you see how this teaching connect with your own life. It is easy when you can, you know, we can ask questions and a, a famous teacher, a, a great guru answers. But the real question you ask yourself and then you look around yourself and then you begin to connect the dots as they say. Then you say, oh, now I see what's going on. Why people are not really happy or why I'm not really happy? Because I'm chasing the wrong thing. Now you've got to find out for yourself what is this that's not uh, that's not making you happy. What is it that keeps you going around in a circle? You got to find out what it is. Now, once you know that, then you get out of it. You you are revulsed with this. No, no, I don't want to be cheated by this. It's like you are burned by fire. You, you say, oh no, I'm not going to touch it anymore. So that kind of that's called revulsion, nibbida. You don't want to get burnt again, right? So burnout, you're helpless. That's nibbida. You see the way out then pasada arises joy this this enthusiasm this you want to reach the path and awaken that's what is pasada the, the positive aspect positive opposite of nibita okay go on please okay thank you brother pia next question from Teo Asep. can brother pia please elaborate on jhana states and stream meaning does a stream winner need to achieve jhana? Okay, last part first. Uh, from my understanding, you don't need jhana to attain stream winning. Of course, if you're a good meditator, it'd be easier to attain stream winning, yes, because you can focus. But the, the Buddha gives provisions for lay people, busy people, family people, people who still love pleasure to attain stream winning and once returning. In fact, there's a term called karma bogi. Karma means pleasure, sensual pleasure. Bogi means consumer, consumer of sensual pleasure. So even if you are a consumer of sensual pleasure, in other words, you have a family, not breaking the precepts by the way, you can still attain stream winning if you keep to the precepts. Because the precepts do not hinder you from attaining stream winning uh, unless you break the precepts. Okay. So the idea here is knowing when to stop. Right? So for, for laymen, we work towards attaining stream winning. You don't need jhana, you don't need meditation. Why? Because a stream winner does not overcome the factor of desire, the factor of uh, sensual desire, kamachanda, uh, that you need jhana. Okay? So for the, for the layman, uh, for, the, for the stream winner, uh, we overcome self-view, self-identity view, that this body, I am this body, this body of the fire aggregate, something like that. We don't identify with your body. You don't say, I own this body, this is my body, right? So you don't, you don't, you, you like that kind of idea. Number two, <clears throat> you don't look for answers outside of yourself. Looking for answers outside of yourself, for example, uh, you, you want to pass the exam, you go to a monk and say, please chant a blessing for me so I'll pass my exam. That, that's looking for answers outside of you. That's called superstitious. Superstition, by the way. When we look for answers outside of ourselves, it is by definition superstition. Because super means above, okay? You, you, you kind of want to go beyond yourself. And, and it won't work because all these problems arise inside you, so you've got to deal with it inside you, right? So, uh, the idea of uh, overcoming doubt means you don't doubt yourself, you don't doubt your self-effort, okay? And then uh, uh, superstition means you're relying on something outside of yourself. So these are the three factors. Self-identity view, doubt, and uh, what do you call that? What's the third one? Uh, looking for answers outside of yourself, okay? Rituals and vows, okay? So, uh, then if you can break these three factors, then you become emotionally independent. You don't need the approval of others to be happy. Uh, you don't need a guru's blessing or smile for you to make your life meaningful. You don't need titles or datoship, whatever, to you know find meaning in life or get respect from others. 
one, one of the things that uh, I realized that sometimes, now if I were to wear a robe now and talk, I think there would be much more people coming to listen. Uh, but I have re renounced the robe, so I have to, and I don't even use any talk doctor or anything like that. I mean, I'm given the title Acharya, you know, it simply means teacher. So I, I didn't object to that since it describes my job, not my status, you know. So if it, it, it describes a status, yeah, then if, if uh, there's a doctor in front of me or I wear some funny hat and I look great because of that and you come to me to listen to all these suttas, I'll be a failure, a complete failure. Because you didn't come to me because of the suttas, you came to me because of my hat or you came to me because of my title. See? So that, that is very silly, isn't it? So we don't say Venerable Doctor Buddha, you know. We, we go straight to the Buddha because we know this is Buddha, that's good enough, right? It's a difficult path. In other words, you, I, I'm teaching without charisma. So without charisma, people will say, oh, you know, what does he know, you know? He doesn't even have a title, he doesn't even look like a monk, you know, all that he talks is suttas, you know? But then those who love suttas, those who know suttas, know that the suttas are valuable. And I'm not here to promote myself, I'm, I'm here to promote suttas, right? So we should do that. Put the Buddha first, as taught in the Garava Sutta. That's the meaning here. Now, if you do that, then you have great faith. That's another quality of a stream winner. Great faith in the Buddha's teaching. Overcoming self-identity view, remember? Okay, next question. Uh, thank you, Padre. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Padre Pia. There's another sh uh, question from Sister Rachel. Can you explain what Vichikicha means? Okay. Vichikicha means doubt. Okay, doubt. Here is a special sense. Uh, important meaning is to doubt yourself that you can do it, you can study the suttas by your own practice, you can find inner calmness and free yourself from suffering. Uh, that means opposite of this is you need to depend on someone else, a, a guru, or someone outside, some kind of outside power, God or, or a demon, whatever. So that's the meaning of Vichikicha, doubt here. Okay? Uh, Chikicha means sickness, actually, illness. So the we is added in front. It has a, we has a similar sense in English like by, like separating it into two you begin to see yourself as separate from you see yourself separate from yourself as it were beside yourself as we say in English so you are not unified you're not able to you know you're not confident and to, to find the truth yourself that's the meaning you, you, you need someone to tell you to, to, to guide you all the way now I'm introducing the suttas to you but I'm not telling you all the way, guiding you all the way, you see. I'm telling you these are what the sutta teaches, you study for yourself, you go back and say, oh, now I understand the sutta better, this is what I should do. Then you have no doubt in yourself. Of course, the, the secondary meaning would be doubt in the Buddha's teaching, in the suttas, uh, doubt in the practice, the meditation, doubt in the Buddha, and so on. Okay, so that, that is a traditional explanation of Doubt in the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. Okay? The Buddha will be the teacher, the Dharma is the teaching, and then the Sangha will be the attainment of the path. Right? That, that's more traditional technical explanation. Uh, I like to explain it as doubting yourself, that you can make the effort yourself to be awakened, which the Buddha in his last days keep reminding us, be an island unto yourself. Island here meaning a meditator, an island above the floods, not an island against everyone else in the world, but an island above the floods. And, and you know this this island, when the flood is gone, they're all mountains, and you find they're all mountains, or they're all connected together. But they're separated by the water of defilements, the water of ignorance, the water of craving. Okay, next question. Um, thank you, Barbia. Uh, it, it's 9.52. You want to take one more question? All right, last one. Uh, last one? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sure. Um, question from Lan Hoon. Uh, could you explain Chanda and Tanha? Okay, wow, this is a good one. Uh, tanha means craving. 
Trishna in Sanskrit and Trishna very close to English word thirst. It's, it's usually has a negative sense. You, you, you feel a sense of emptiness, you don't have it and you want it. This drive to collect something. Okay, that's, that's Tanha, craving. In rarely Tanha used in a good sense, but usually it's a negative sense. Chanda, on the other hand, sometimes translate as desire, even will, you know, willpower. Uh, so Chanda can have a, a, a good sense. For example, in, in a Chanda can mean this, this uh, determination to do something, love for the Dharma. Uh, when when you, you love doing something good, that also can be used. Uh, can be said to be chanda. So chanda has a, can have a good sense, but when you say kama chanda, then it's negative. Kama chanda is a sensual desire. Right? So in a sense, uh, chanda is very much like the English word desire. It can be good, it can be bad, depending on what the goal is, what the intention is. Okay, very good question. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for the time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brother Pia. Thank you, Sister Isim. Um, thank you, everyone, for your questions. Uh, we will close our session for today. And um, we will, uh, as mentioned earlier, people from Malaysia, could you please stay back for a while after the end of the class? Okay, uh, Brother Pia, over to you for the closing puja. All right. Yes. <clears throat> right this is our second last class. Ne? We have looked at the long Aganya Sutta. Of course, we, some of us still have to digest it. And uh, whenever we look at the Sutta, you try to recall those parts that you understand, those parts that you find interesting, those parts that you can connect with. You don't have to tell yourself, oh, I must understand everything you know, before I can accept it. Just take a bit here, a bit there, like a bee collecting this uh, sweetness from the uh, plants without harming the plants. So that's how we learn a bit here, a bit there. Uh, in Pali we say tokang tokang, bit by bit. And every time you listen to the suttas, to the Dhamma, you keep your mind open, wisdom will arise through reflection over time. Sometimes immediately, but usually over time. So give yourself that time because as we mature as we age we begin to put things together more clearly and I can speak from experience because for over 50 years I've been studying the same things the same suttas and they make even more sense now and I'm even more happy with them now so we listen to the suttas to feel happy where is that happiness and follow the suttas there then do your meditation, even simple five minutes. Feel that joy, that peace. And together you will see this wonderful brightness inside you. So reflecting in this way is very wonderful, good karma. We have kept the five precepts today. We have done some meditation. We have listened to the suttas. Remember this wonderful moment. They will help you in your meditation in the future and when you have difficulties. Say, by the power of all these good things you have done, that I have done, may I be well, may I be happy. But that's how you can say it, by an act of truth. So with that, let us close this session for today with the closing salutations. Arahang Samma Sambuddho Bhagawa Buddhang Bhagawantang Abhiwademi Bow down. Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Bow down. Supatipanno Bhagavato Savaka Sango Sangang Namami Bow down. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. May you all be well and happy.